Welcome back to the PewterCast. This is the second half of our Final Thoughts episode. I am Brent Allen, your host, joined as always by Rindax, my co-host, Ren. Yo. Still doing okay over there, buddy? Yeah, man. Just doing some Christmas shopping. There you go. There you go. Well, while you're doing that, uh, we're going to look into some of the emails in the first half of the show, which came out earlier this week. Uh, we got to talk to our friend Justin Pulowski over at the Bucks Uncensored podcast. Uh, and then we also got to give our final thoughts on the show, grade out the Bucks versus Ravens game. And now it is your turn, Bucks fans. This is where we turn to you. Several of you guys have sent in some emails, and so we're going to get to those. We also have a brand new iTunes review to get to, Ren, as what? well. I know, I know, which is very cool. Um, so we'll get over to that. So, Ren, why don't we go ahead and just jump right into it? We always start with the iTunes reviews as they come in, which is nice. It's been a couple of weeks since we've had one. Uh, this is a five star review. Thank you so yes. much, which comes in from FL Boy, uh, and it's spelled with an I, B O I, Florida Boy. Uh, he says this has hands down been the best podcast for Bucks fans this season. You can tell that Brent and Ren are real fans, and they really love the Bucks, even if I don't always agree with their opinions, <laughs> like their insistence on keeping Cutter. He needs to go. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Apparently, this one was written before the Instant Cast this past week. Yeah. Uh, he says, but I still love the pod, as Ren calls it. Everyone needs to listen. Thanks, All right, Florida man. boy. Thanks, man. Boy! That's how I have to say it. No, don't. Let, just let me do it. I wonder if it's an uh, Avril Lavigne fan over there. Yep. See, you should have just left it alone, man. <laughs> <laughs> just, just left. I told you to leave it alone. You didn't. Uh, if Skater Boy happens to be the music for this week, this, don't blame this. me. Blame Florida Boy. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, thank you so much. And hey, listen, uh, you guys have been awesome with iTunes reviews this this year. You guys have sent in a ton. Uh, it has been awesome. I want to say thank you to Florida Boy. Boy. There you go. Uh, and everyone else who has sent in iTunes reviews. Guys, listen, it really helps the show. It helps get the word out about the show. Populates us higher as people start looking for a buck in your podcast. Uh, it, and it affects other things, other outside of iTunes as well from the way I understand it works. But um, yeah, you guys have really been awesome. And, hey, listen, keep those coming because uh, we're we're over 100 now, which is really cool. Um you guys really? Rock. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Remember we, we had that giveaway a couple weeks ago when we oh, hit the hundred oh. mark. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. There was uh, a whole thing we did about it. Yeah. Yeah. So this show, uh, you know, just, you guys are awesome uh, with that. Now, um, one of the things talking about uh, the show and you guys as fans, something you guys are going to get to do coming up very soon guys. And by soon, I mean, very, very soon. The the third annual Pewtercast Awards show is going to be happening. The and Pewties. The Pewties, the mini Lombardies, they're going out. And if you guys are new to the show, which several of you guys are, uh, because we have almost tripled the number of listeners that we've had from this time last year to where we are now, which is awesome. Thank you guys for, for uh, you know supporting the show, for listening to the show. Um but listen, if you if you've not heard about that, we do an award show, and this is like a full on award show. Like people get stuff, but it only happens because you guys vote. And even in a crappy season like the one that we've had, there are still some good things about it. There are still uh, you know things that we want to honor. Uh, there are players that we want to honor, even coaches, and even people outside of the Buccaneers organization. So you guys be on the lookout for that. That is coming very very soon. The nominating committee has been uh, this week getting back in. And their nomination form so we can form uh it formulate and and complete what you guys are actually going to be voting on it is the only fan voted award show in tampa bay as far as we know and uh you guys are awesome so and we're not gonna check and i'm yeah it <laughs> could be some other ones out there but whatever so only tampa bay buccaneers fan voted award show there you go and and here's the thing i think you and i Ren, are both plugged in enough to what's happening out there in Tampa Buc in Tampa Bay Buccaneer fan land that we would know if there was another one. Oh yeah. 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 I, I think But you so. said Tampa Bay Awards show. 
that that like I, I meant the Buccaneers. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. specifically I meant the Buccaneers. So uh, there we go. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, when? How long do you think it's going to take before somebody copies us? I. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it happened this year. To be honest with you. Yeah. If somebody else. You think, yeah. you think they're going to actually do trophies and stuff, or just? Just do like polls. I don't know, but we do actual trophies. Like we do actual awards that get sent engraved to the players. Trophies. Engraved, yeah, yeah. They're we personalized. Got we've gotten pictures back. You got a letter back from Dirk Cutter. I did from the very first year. He won one of the very first ones. Um, how odd is that? Now? How how times have changed. <laughs> the person who won Coach of the Year for the very first one was Mike Smith. So, uh, but I tell you what, Ren, last year, uh, people who are new to the show won't know this, but last year, Mark Duffner won the coach of the year award. And I got to tell you, just looking at the nomination forms, it might be no surprise. Uh, he will very much be on the, on the nominating on the, he will be nominated once again. So he'll be on the ballot. Yeah. He could repeat, uh, depending on how you fans out there vote. So, um, would that be called a Duff Pete? A du- uh, no, a reefner. A, a reef. <laughs> it sounds like something we need to legalize in the state of Florida. Is what that sounds like. Uh, okay, all right. Let's move on, Ren. Let's move on. Enough about all of that. Um, emails. Let's get to some emails. All right. We've got several here. Uh, I am going to go back. We, we had several people send us in some emails last week. If you sent me in one this week, I'm not going to read your one from last week. So uh, you're not going to double dip. But there are a few people who sent some in last week and some new people who sent some in this week. And I think most of these are still uh, not time sensitive. Like, so they'll still carry over. So it should work. But why don't we go ahead and do this? Our first one comes to us today from Corey. Corey says, hey, guys, I figured I'd give my two cents on the cutter situation. Says, now, I've heard a lot of people say that we are the Browns of the NFC. Like you guys have said that, which I'm not sure. Have we ever you actually? Have. have we? Okay. You did. Uh, when you had a uh, wrestler Joe on. Because mm-hmm. you wanted to know if he'd heard that that before. Yeah, I don't know that I was necessarily saying that as much as just saying that it's a saying. But whatever. Doesn't matter. Uh, Craig as well, too, in Vegas. <laughs> has also said that uh, the guys at Bucks and Brews and among others. I disagree. Rather, I think this team resembles a different AFC North team, the Cincinnati Bengals. Interesting. He says their fans have endured a team with a culture of mediocrity similar to ours. Brents once said that he asked himself, is Cutter the coach that will lead us to the Super Bowl? No. Well, if that is the case, then why stick with the coach? Well, that's what they've endured in Bengals country with the coach. Some pretty star-studded rosters. They failed to register a playoff win in 15 years. Wait, is that true? I think I've heard that like with um, the Bengals. Like, they've made the playoffs several times in Marvin Lewis's tenure up there, but they mm-hmm. have never actually won a playoff game. Is that true? That is correct. Wow. That's got to hurt. Uh, but they've stayed with him. They've stayed with Marvin Lewis. Yeah. Talk uh, about continuity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, more similarities I've noticed with Cutter and Lewis are that they, as you put it, they are slow to change. Um, this guy obviously follows other teams more so than, than I do anyway. Um, he says, my opinion being that this is not a pet peeve or an annoying tendency. It's a sign of poor coaching. That's fair. Yeah, he says not playing rookies is something that Marvin Marvin Lewis is notorious for. Look how go, how good Joe Mixon is. Look at Chad Johnson's numbers in his second year. Look at the way his offensive coordinator uses John Ross or a guy the guy with Olympic speed. We have the exact same issues that preclude us from getting over the hump. Whether it's Beninock, Rojo, Martin, Kappa, OJ, Godwin, or etc. The comparison someone made on the instant cast is correct. We have a Jeff Fisher like coach. Mm, yeah. I don't know about that. Jeff Fisher was one loss away becoming the all-time losing his head coach in NFL history, and they fired him, mm-hmm. which I'm a little upset about, by the way. <laughs> I wish the Rams would just let him get one more loss. <laughs> who, what, who is the all-time losing his coach in NFL history, Ryan? I have, I have no idea. Oh, okay. I have no idea. It's probably somebody shocking like Shula. 
you know, Bill I doubt it is. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, but somebody Vince who's Lombardi. like somebody who's like on the Hall of Fame, but right. you know, their record was like like six hundred and thirty, but they coached for forty years, so they have so many losses. Right. But won a Super Bowl two along the way. There you go. Um, let's see. I lost my place. Oh, here we go. Uh, Jeff Fisher. Now, here's the thing, though. I got, I'll tell you where Jeff Fisher and Marvin Lewis are are similar in to me. That is not going to be the case with with uh, Coach Cutter. Is I don't understand how for both of those guys they keep coming back to the same team. Like I thought, Jeff Fisher should have been fired years before he was ever let go by the Rams, and. I, you know, Marvin Lewis, I'm surprised that he's still with the Bengals as well. So, so is every, so is Marvin Lewis. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. What? So, all right. I guess I'll show up next year then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's hear. Uh, Corey goes on. He says, as for the, and Ren, this is directed to you. Okay. We might lose our explosive offense idea if Dirk leaves. I don't agree. There are hundreds of coaching candidates who would love to get a shot at running an offense with as much talent as ours. The national media has predicted the 10 teams that might have new coaches and rated them in terms of attractiveness, and we ranked number three, only behind the Browns and the Packers. Yeah, that that, that was sort of when I – I like to do a lot of self-examination on my opinions, um, uh-huh. and I usually think about my opinions a long time before I say them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't. I don't say things you know off the cuff and, and stick by them. But I had to be honest with myself that the only reason that I didn't want Dirk cut fired was because of the offense. Mm-hmm. But that was just me being scared. It was just yeah. like, look, we have like the best offense the Buccaneers ever had. I, you know, there's been a stat that's been floating around where, uh, like the four years Cutter's been head coach or offense coordinator slash head coach they all rank in the top five in total offense of the Buccaneers history. But that's not, especially with the way the rules are now in the NFL, like that's not to say that someone else can't come in here and do it. Right. You know? Right. And, uh, let's be honest. It's not really a high bar to get to, you know, if you can, <laughs> if every year you, you're, you're the offense coordinator and every year you, you don't necessarily set a new franchise record, but you're in the top five. Cause they're all, you know, you're all, similar in, in yardage and however you want to grade it uh that doesn't mean you should keep your job you know at the, and that's what i was doing i was just being I, w- I, w- I was thinking scared like playing scared or or i just didn't want to change because i didn't want the offense to go away now if there, but what i had to convince myself of i guess is just because dirt cutter goes away doesn't mean the explosive offense is going to there's lots of explosive offenses out there there's lots of you know good OCs, good, good head coaches. And, and, uh, yeah. So I agree what you're saying. Yeah. It just took me a while to get there to, you know, just figure out that wanting to keep Dirk cutter as, as the head coach, be, just because of the offense now is not enough for me. There's too many other things that I don't like that what's going on that, uh, and most of it's intangible stuff like culture and leadership and, and, things they let slide and slow to change. It's just, it, it's not his play calling or, you know, his style or, or how he conducts himself at the podium or, you know, his personality or how he treats the press. It's, it's, it's those intangible things that, uh, that are just adding up. And, um, but I will say, I think he's got a raw, he got a raw deal, but I, it, but it's by his own, it's his own fault. He, he had a chance to fire Mike Smith and, and do some revamps on the defensive side of the ball this year, and that probably would have saved his job, but he didn't. So Yeah. Uh, Corey goes on, and he, he, starts, he talks a lot more about Cutter, but in the end, he comes down to this. He says, sorry for the essay. I just feel like Cutter's poor qualities now outweigh his good ones, which is kind of what you said. Uh, when you kind yeah. of came to your big announcement uh, during the instant cast, uh, that's, that's really pretty much uh, – how you defined it. So, all right. Uh, thank you, Corey. Our next email comes to us from Donovan, our friend Donovan from Philly. He says, so am I the only person who's still butt hurt about Q about the QB? Uh, I think he's talking about, this is the saints game, uh, blocking our punt. John D Filippo <laughs> was fired. Oh boy. And J.R. Sweezy looked like he never had a back issue in his life on Monday night. 
I'm 50-50 on keeping Dirk, but I also believe the cutter, the Glazers need to clean house. Keep up the good work, Donovan from Philly. Well, the reason Hill, the QB for the Saints, is on the team is because he can't play special teams. That's really what he is. He's a special teamer. He comes in and runs sort of like a wildcat or, or option uh, I don't think I've ever seen the guy hand off when he plays quarterback. Like he's like, Oh, I get like three times a game. To touch the ball. I ain't handing off to anybody. Right. Uh, and from the Saints games that I've seen, you know, when he's back there, you know, playing quarterback, uh, they're like two thirds. They don't work two thirds of the times they don't work. And maybe that's because he doesn't hand the ball off when he's supposed to, but he's also, you know, he's a Swiss army knife. He's, he's, he, he, he reminds me a lot of sort of what Adam Humphreys might could be, you know, Adam Humphreys played quarterback in high school. You know, he's obviously athletic enough to, to play gunner uh, on, on special teams or, or rush the kicker on special teams. And, you know, he can, he can throw the ball if you want to put him in for two, three, four plays at quarterback to run some type of package with him. Uh, but we don't, and I'm, I'm fine with that. So, you know, the guy's really more of a special team. He's just an athlete is what he is. So I'm not really mad that he blocked the punt. Yeah. I'm mad the punt got blocked. Yeah. I'm mad that, that, that you know, Katzer still has a job because uh, our special teams are, are – they're not good. You know, I, I know when you give a punt block or a punt return for a touchdown or a kickoff, that's when fingers really start to point. But you watch this Baltimore game and, you know, the punt coverage was okay. The kickoff coverage was bad. It just it's 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 not a plus. Like the the special teams never help the team; they only take away from the team. And it might be as little as you know letting the guy take the kickoff out to the forty five yard line mm-hmm. instead of it's just it's just those little things. It, it, they're not good. They're they're right. average at best and probably subpar. Right. So I guess that's more what I'm upset about. And what else did he talk about? Uh, that was pretty much it. Um, oh, uh, John DeFlippo, Um Oh, yeah. He was and, the big uh, hot. Sweezy. Well, Sweezy, I think that was just a time thing. You know, the Bucks sort of got burnt on the big contract because he didn't show up the first year. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, especially with back issues, I mean, I know I'm switching sports, but you see Tiger Woods. It took him like three years to come back yeah. from his back. You know, and this is Sweezy's third year. So they just kind of got burnt. You know, they signed him and then he hurt his back. He was out a whole year. You know, like, hey, you got to play because, you know, we need something back. We need some kind of return on the money. And he just wasn't the player he was before. And now it looks like his back is back and finally healthy. And it's just, you know, bad luck on that one. And Di Filippo, that's something everyone's been talking about. He was like the new hot. I'm going to be the like, he's going to be the next head coach. Like everyone's number one guy going into next year as Minnesota's offensive coordinator, and they fired him. <laughs> so yeah. everyone's like, ah, okay. And yeah. It's hard to argue with Mike Zimmer, man. I mean, <laughs> you know, right? Uh, I think the only thing that I would comment on here is he says where he believes that the Glazers need to clean house. And I don't know, Ren. This I feel like this conversation is coming sooner and sooner and sooner. Uh, right now is not it though. Of of our coaching staff, who should go and who should stay? And, it, you know, is it a full clean house with the coaching staff? We've already had a pretty lengthy conversation about Jason Light. Um, right. I, I think we're all agreed about Dirk, but it's really the rest of the people right now. Um, and, uh, yeah, maybe we'll have that conversation here uh, pretty soon. But I don't know that we necessarily need to get rid of everybody. Um, and I don't know if – you know, obviously we're not going to have the choice, but it might be one of the the demands or just the understanding or the contract that if we do have a new head coach that he's – you get to pick your own staff. You do, you know? yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, you know, Duffner might get, might get to interview for the job and Munkin might get to interview for his job and, mm-hmm. you know, other guys might get to interview for their job, but – we can't just like we need to keep that guy, this guy, that guy. Get rid of this guy because it's 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 not how it works, right? It's just it's right. just not how it works. Right. So it's kind of like we could say this is why I'd like to see back. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's really the you know. So imagine you're a new head coach coming in. Uh, you know who would we like to see that head coach retain? Um, 
Uh, the, I guess the only other way to do that is, is uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes when they fire a head coach, don't they go ahead and release everybody? Or do they usually just do the head coach and wait for the new coach to come in before they release the rest of the staff? Uh, I do not know. Yeah, I can't, I do I can't not remember. Know. Um, I think it's a... Uh, huh. I think I've seen it both ways mm-hmm. um, where like they just fire the head coach and everyone just, you know, but hangs out in limbo. So they can, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like, well, you're not, you know, you're not fired, but you're not hired either. So, right. Um, you still have a contract with us, but you know, we're going to pay you because coaching contracts are fully guaranteed, but I don't know if, you know, you'll be with the team next year, but I've also seen it where it's like, you know, they fired the head coach. They fired the OC. They fired the wide receivers coach. They fired, you know, like they'll fire like five or six guys all at once too. So right, it's all up to the Glazers. Mm-hmm. All right. Next email comes into us from Daquan. He says, "Hey guys, I left some things on the table the last time I called in. I don't know if that's because I didn't expect y'all to answer my call or what, but thanks for making a bad day a little <laughs> bit better." Uh, to that, uh, pretty much here's the deal. If we're on an instant cast, we'll take your call unless somebody else has already called in. Um, so, you know, you guys keep calling, we'll, we'll keep taking them. So, uh, thanks for calling in Daquan and keep calling in. Uh, we'll talk to you in the future. Here's what he says. though. He says, I feel like the offense is fine. Yes. The penalties are a problem and it puts a spotlight on Jameis to be perfect when the O-line decides not to commit penalties, which isn't fair, but Hey, we do need to I, we do need to be heavily invested on defense again. If we can get the defense as stacked as our offense, games where our offense is shut down, our defense can save us. Just a thought. Go Bucks. Well, we had this conversation with Pulaski, didn't we? I yep. mean, he ran through the whole defense, yep. and you know, we also had this conversation with the uh, guys from Real Bucks talk during the Saints game. You look along the defensive line, well. You can lose Golson because he's pretty much been nullified with with the emergence of Viavea and uh, Carl Nassib. Mm-hmm. Uh, we still got um, Curry under contract, JPP still under contract, McCoy still under contract. Which I don't mind bringing back McCoy if he doesn't become a problem as far as salary wise. Sure, you know if the things they want to do and they could they, they fit his salary in there, then yeah, keep him. Um, of course, uh, so. You've got, you know, you got Bo Allen, um, who has a contract, so he's not really going anywhere. So you've got like these, what, four or five guys, six guys that you've already got set. So, you know, you're you're set there. Linebackers, you know, depending on Quan, but more than likely, we're probably set there. Mm-hmm. The corners, you got two young corners, and we, you know, we're all we're really hoping that. Vernon turned the corner this year and it looked like he was uh, Mm -hmm. before he got hurt in the first game. Uh, I think everyone likes uh, the way Carlton Davis plays. Uh, He's played like a rookie, but he's all, you know, he, uh, I think we just like his style out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then Justin Evans who sort of disappeared uh, this year um, due to injuries and some other things. Uh, And then Jordan Whitehead who Dirk Cutter talked about, uh, a few times without prompting mm-hmm. during, you know, press conferences. So it, it's, 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 you know, it's the back end is real young and athletic and the front end got some experience with some really good players. So mm-hmm. I, I, th- I think we're okay defensively. Like I would not hate it going into, you know, not getting a first, second rounder or a third rounder in the draft or this high end free agent who's, going to come in and start i mean yeah i'd like it you know you go out and get like a top tier corner of course i'd like that but uh yeah i i just i really and i think we've seen it it's the scheme it wasn't the players it was mike smith Mm -hmm. and we've seen it happen yeah i i think it's i I mean gosh ren even look at it it's some of these some of these games we've had in recent weeks, uh, not necessarily the Ravens game, but we look at how the defense has come on with basically what is backups and practice squad guys in the secondary and the defense is and linebacker some, and line. Yeah. Uh, and the defense has had some decent games and 
you know, they the played well the day, enough to win. Sure, sure. And at the end of the day, it's got to be coaching. I think this is where we just sit back and see coaching. So I am, I am less concerned about stacking the defense, although there's work to be done there. I mm-hmm. think there's still work to be done on the offense. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, there's it, – it's, it's you got to get the right coach. And I really wonder – I don't know I keep hinting about this with, with Jason Light, but, I mean, it, you were talking about it a little bit earlier with something else. But, you know, if Jason Light is going out and saying, okay, Mike Smith, what kind of guys do you run? And he's getting guys to fit Mike Smith. I wonder if there's been a part where Jason said, yeah, I really like, you know – player player x over here but i know he doesn't fit coach y over here so i'm gonna go get player z who does kind of fit this over here but man i really would have liked to have had him like i wonder how much that has you know or hey coach who do you want um and and that's kind of dictated maybe a little bit of who jason light has gone after um you know getting a new coach in here just says just go get me some damn good players and i'll figure out how to use them Stop worrying about trying to fit them into my scheme. Just go get good players, and we'll figure out how to use them. Um, I'd like to see that. So, all righty. Uh, let's see here. Daquan, thank you for your email. All right. Our next email comes in to us from a buddy, Chris, from Virginia. And uh, this is a email from this week. He says, Peter, guys, well, another year with no playoffs. Hashtag crying gif. Jif? gif don't don't care he says i'm with you guys i wasn't going to get my hopes up for a bucks win i expected them to lose and just sort of hoped that they won yeah he says i'm with rin about rojo i feel like rojo hasn't had many opportunities even uh he wasn't even dressed for the first three games of the season he's had 23 rushing attempts in 10 games where the offenses had like 60 plays a game another failure to develop a running back under tim spencer uh, I saw them do a screen pass to quiz in the middle of the field, yet they throw it to Rojo on the outside. Gosh, I'll be so happy when quiz is off the team along with Grimes. Can they just not dress Grimes and Krim in quiz for the next two games? I don't mind quiz, you know, but I, I would like to see his touches go to Rojo. The problem is the reason quiz is in there and getting touches at all is because it's third down, you know, you know, he's he's the third down guy that's going to pick up the blitz, mm-hmm. stay in on max protect, and then leak out to the middle of the field and be a safety net. That's all he does. Mm-hmm. That is all he does. They've quit giving him the ball, thank God. Right. Uh, and so that's what he does. And, you know, according to Cutter, who you have to trust on his, on his evaluations, that Ronald Jones isn't good at that yet or good enough to get in there. Mm-hmm. You know, so I would – since we're out of the playoffs, I would almost like to see – Rojo and Peyton Barber's role switch, like make Mm -hmm. Rojo the main back and then put Peyton Barber in as the third down back and then just like not play quiz only on special. What what do you think about Grimes since we're in the, I mean, it's not like we have a bunch of cornerbacks sitting on our practice squad or, you know, in depth uh, that we could run that same scenario with. But what, what do you think about doing that with Grimes? I, you know, it's, I don't want sort of be a prisoner of the moment about how upset I am about watching him play that Baltimore game. But we're not, you're not going to play anybody else in the whole entire NFL, let alone this year, that's going to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not going to basically run a zone read offense for, you know, three and a half quarters because that's what they, that's what they did. They they barely threw the ball and it was just you know. Power, counter, ISO, pull the ball out, get around the end. Power, counter, ISO, pull the ball out, get around the end. And in a game like that, Brent Grimes has shown in his past, like, let's face it, Brent Grimes, yes, he's a pro bowler. But he's never made the pro bowl and be able, because of his ability to come up and set the edge and stop the run. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's never going to be disinterested in tackling as he was last week against the Ravens. And a team, so we got the Falcons and we got the Cowboys coming up. The Cowboys, it's kind of a 50 50. It depends on what you think they're going to do. And I would make the adjustment, you know, during the game with Grimes. If if the Cowboys come out and they're like, we're going to, we just saw what Baltimore did to you, and we're going to do the same thing. You know, we're going to protect Dak and his, and his hot and cold 
you know, starts and game to game and quarter to quarter accuracy. And we're just going to run Zeke right at Brent Grimes. And if they do that, then you got to counter and put somebody in there as well and stick their face in there. The Falcons game, they're not going to do that. Like they're going to, the Falcons are going to look a lot like us. They're going to run the ball and they're going to pass the ball, but they don't have this sort of power running game that the, that the Cowboys have and uh, definitely not the Ravens have. So I think he should play the, the Falcons game. I think he should start both and see what happens. You know, it's just if do you? I mean, you know, we mentioned this earlier. You watch game film. Uh, Cowboys are watching game film. If you're Ezekiel Elliott and you're noticing this about Grimes, are you going to try to run at him? Yeah, maybe a little bit more. <laughs> oh, I don't know about a little bit more. I mean, I think I think teams run at Grimes all the time. Yeah, you know, it's but the Bucks have been good enough. You know, especially early on in the year with with the linebackers to force teams to get into situations where they have to throw. The only problem was the first half of the year that was highly successful when you threw, you know, remember when uh, players weren't even in the picture, like we'd watch an away game and they'd throw to a guy and there was no Buccaneer in the whole entire picture on the TV, like nobody. So it, I, you know, it really wasn't a, a deterrent not to throw the ball. Um, but yeah, I'm sure they're going to come after Grimes. They've everyone, they've always come after Grimes. They just really, really, really went after Grimes in the Ravens game, and and uh, you know Duffner didn't adjust, and it was it was frustrating because you know that that game, like you said in the Instacast, the game was never out of hand. You know, right? Obviously by the score, like we were always in it. It was just, it was just like one play. Like all we needed was one play, and uh, I don't think the defensive staff put us in the best position to. Uh, be able to put the offense in the best position to win the game. Chris goes on in his email. He says, Craig said it best. Our special teams is a comedy because every time they're on the field, they're bound to mess up in a different way each week. And to keep my sanity, all you can do is laugh. It's like the three stooges where Mo slips with a pie in his hand and it just turns into a disaster. How is it that opposing DBs can be all over Evans and he doesn't get a DPI, but he gets an OPI when he barely touches the guy. It's bad when you gave the president of officiating. Uh, would you have the president of officiating say this should be a penalty and that shouldn't have been a penalty hashtag only the bucks. Yeah, there was a, um, I think it was a, maybe the third pass to Evans. And I think it was a third down play too, where a guy came over his back and it, that was probably the worst produced football game i can remember seeing it was like a preseason game Mm -hmm. like you barely got any replays like you didn't get a replay on the on the brent grimes pi you didn't get a replay on the mike evans that he thought was a pi like there was lots of things where i wanted to see what happened and like chris godwin Mm -hmm. when you know they were trying to throw him in the end zone before they kicked the field goal uh and he was looking for a flag, like no, there was no replay. It was it was poorly done. But to get back to what he said, yeah, you know, the guy on Fox who's, uh, I don't think he is the president of officiating, but, you know, was at one point. Um, yeah, he said the pick, pick or grab or whatever you want to call the rub that Mike Evans did should not have been called. And, you know, I think the announcer said on the game that the one where Mike wanted the one I was talking about earlier should have mm-hmm. been called. We you, it, and that was kind of that played a little bit to where I'm saying the Ravens got lucky. Like there was, there was, I'm sure there was plenty of plays that the Buccaneers did that the Ravens felt that the Bucks were cheating and didn't get called. But watching it live and even through the second playthrough, there were for me, and I might be biased as a Buck fan, I thought the Ravens got away with a lot of crap defensively. I really did. Yeah. I, I You know, somebody said, and I don't usually put too much stock in this fact. I kind of scoff at it when I heard it of, oh, these refs are trying to hand the game to the Ravens. Like, I get that feeling. I get that sentiment. And I could say that every once in a while. I don't necessarily mean it. You know, I I really don't generally think the refs are bought out or they're trying to hand the game. But I got to be honest, there was a couple times that I really sat back and was like, are they really trying to hand this game to the Ravens? Because it seemed like it. Like, I was like, that's just I mean, you're calling BS plays against us and not calling things against them that are so ridiculously obvious. But, 
you know, it's it's an official official's job is hard. It really is, but um, but it usually balances out. It you does. Know? Yeah, it didn't seem like it balanced out in this one. Yeah, you, know, you see one, you're like, what? Like that's terrible. And then the next time the other team gets the ball, there's this ticky tack holding penalty or something. Right. You're like, and in the back of your head, you're like, okay, there's the makeup call. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But this game, there were none. No, uh, uh-uh, uh, 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 uh-uh. uh. So all and right. there could have been. There yeah. could have been. Right. There should. There should have been. Right. It wasn't hard. Uh, Chris wraps up his email. Says at least with a new coach, he'll have a top ten pick to work with. Bucks wanted to reclaim their seat at the bottom of the NFC South. Chris from Virginia. <laughs> well, we're not top ten. So we've got two more games, and uh, you know we'll have to see what the Falcons do. I guess coming up Sunday. You know, I I heard, and I I don't know if this is true, but I, I'm going to assume it is that even though the Buccaneers lost this particular week because of what other teams did, they actually dropped a few draft picks. Yeah. That's True crazy. Draft. Well, that's the way the tiebreakers go, man. Yeah. But, I mean, all that stuff will get, you know, you look at it now, you're like, oh, it's so unfair, blah, 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 blah. But if the Bucks lose these next two games, like, they're probably top, you know, they'll be up in the around 5-6. They will right. be because somebody's going to win a game. That means the Falcons won one. So, <laughs> right. because we lost, you know, they, it, it all work itself out. It just, it, you know, that's when I, I feel like we've had calls in the Instacast or, or other emails and previous pods are like, well, you know, where's our draft position or what do you think? It's like, look, man, there are guys that work that out. And then mm-hmm. we have three months to talk about it. I, I I'm, I'm more than fine to waiting till the end of, of week 17 and have, you know, Terry Bradshaw tell me on Fox where my draft position is yeah. <laughs> because then I have three months to uh, talk about that. Right. Which is why I don't worry about mock drafts that are coming out right now. All right. Our next email comes into us from Will from North Yorkshire, the United Kingdom, not University of Kentucky. This might be Will's first email writing into us. It's possible. All right, Will. Uh, he says this. He says, after listening to your instant cast, I thought I'd chime in with my thoughts about the defense getting tired. Well, this was a fun conversation we had. Yeah. The theory behind it is that offensive players know when the snap is coming, so they can be in their stance nice and relaxed, only tensing the moment before the snap. Defensive players, on the other hand, need to be tense and ready to go at any moment, which is more tiring through hard counts and the like. I think there is something to this theory as having played both offense and defensive line to no great level. And it was always like it was always more tiring to play the defensive line. Uh, He says there also may be some residual bias from the days of yore when passing was seen as a soft and not so tiring. However, I agree with Ren. They're all excuses. A half-competent defense should be able to stop a one-dimensional offense. Great podcast, lads. Wish I could take part, but you record much too late for me. Keep up the good work. Will from North Yorkshire. Thanks, Will. Yeah, I mean, that's a theory, too. But, you know, as what I said in the Instacast, that, like, none of that, that's just, it's sort of garbage. Like, mm-hmm. okay, so you have to be more tense. And I, I get it. You're right. And, and being more like intense or into it and not having as much time to relax can be obviously be more physically draining draining well just then just train that much more like it's there's not a cap on how in shape you have to be like or can be you know there you like if it's it doesn't matter it's all about conditioning and this you know oh they wore us down well why Mm -hmm. like you're rotating guys. They're not. Why are they wearing you down? Well, because they had us out there for so many plays. Well, then train for that. Right. Like, practice for that. So that that's where it just – and like I said, it's it's been around forever. I'm not going to call it an old wives' tale. I, I, I understand all the little tiny nuances that, that make the offense not have to work as hard as the defense from play to play. But that's the lot you've been given, and if you don't want the offense <laughs> to wear you down, take steps not to let them wear you down. Yeah, I thank you. Thanks for the email, though. Yeah, I I I can't disagree with you. I'm an offensive lineman and uh, was, and 
I don't care how tired the defensive line goes. The idea of I, I got to tell you though, I, and maybe I just wasn't playing the position right. Uh, you get down there, you get lined up as even as an offensive lineman, you're still tense. Like you're you're still dialed in and ready to go at, at any moment. Because um, I got to tell you, they're especially in high school. Um, sometimes the and I've seen it actually in the NFL. Sometimes the center gets confused and snaps the ball at the wrong time, and you've got to be ready or you'll get your clock clean from the guy across from you. But, uh, hey, we had a first with this email, though, Ren, and not just that it came from Will or from North Yorkshire. This is the first time you and I have ever been called lads. Can you prove that? On this show. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Another first. I guess put it in the put it in the first – trophy case i don't <laughs> there you go all right put, put in the back though it's, it's, a, not, it's, it's, it's not it's not it's not it was a poor a poor attempt at humor all right i will i will not be pulling that out when company comes over oh here's something you haven't seen look we got called on this, lads. On this date i was called lad what do you think <laughs> about that pretty cool huh our next email comes from alex from daytona he says first I sent the email asking about how Ren felt about keeping Cutter if Munkin left last week before Ren stated that he has jumped on the fire cutter train. It was an email we didn't get to read, uh, but he did send in an email saying, uh, asking you that question. But you're now on the fire cutter train, Ren. So uh, he says, I see a lot of people attacking Godwin for these last two games, but I would like to hear your takes on this. Is it mental? Is it injury? Or does he have a problem catching in the rain? Uh, I'm going to call last, but I can say last week's game, the saints game, an aberration. You know, I think uh-huh. he's put out a body of enough body of work there to, uh, one target or one catch in 10 targets is that's not, that's going to be the outlier. Uh, and they threw to him three times. I think the Baltimore game, one, he dropped, mm-hmm. which everyone's jumping on him. The second one, he caught for a first down penalty on ryan jensen so it didn't count and then i think he caught another one later uh so yeah not his best two games obviously but Mm -hmm. i'm not and i know people are when you lose you point fingers like you know we've talked about this like last week it was offensive line you know the week before that it was turnover a lot of times it's jamison turnovers we'd win if we just didn't turn the ball over we'd win if the defense could you know not give up 30 points in the half right which is a pretty solid one but you know so if you want to jump on Chris Godwin for his past two weeks, I get it. You know, you have every right to, I just don't think that, you know, that defines him as a player moving forward. I I think he's, he's going to be more than fine. I'll go with you on that. Uh, does he have a problem catching the rain? Maybe. Uh, well, know. he's good for one drop a game. Let's face it. Uh, that's got to go away. Okay. Now I, I heard you say that um, yeah. in the instant. I said, it a, few, I said and, it a few times. And I've heard you say it a few times. Is that like, historically is that true like just outside yeah. of these last two games has that been yeah he'll drop one a game so will so will uh oj howard mike evans N- well it depends <laughs> he he goes back and forth like he'll uh-huh. have a couple of games where he'll have a drop in a row and then he'll then he won't drop any for like four weeks and then mm-hmm. he'll have one where he drops one then he'll drop one for two weeks then he'll have like two weeks in a row where he drops one so it's not as consistent but mm-hmm. I understand that it's, it's probably an overstatement that Godwin and OJ Howard drop a pass a game, but it's not, it's closer to the truth than his lie. Put it that way. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Alex continues with his email. He says a few months ago, I sent in an email about Winston needing a great run game to be able to sustain his career. I'm not as articulate as I would like to be. So it came out more as anti Jameis, which kind of upset Wren. But you guys mentioned it now about how conservative Jameis' style is great, but it needs a stronger run game to rely on. You guys say it better than I can, but that's what I was trying to explain back then. All right. Cool. I mean, yeah, if I get upset, I, you know, I'm never mad at, at, at anybody. Well, that's not true. Um, <laughs> about on the podcast well that's mm-hmm. not true either but but if i disagree i just disagree and sometimes you know my my voice got might get a little higher or my tone might get a little harsh but that's just the way that's just the way i argue trust me uh cheryl hates it too so 
nothing, you know, nothing personal with that. Um, but I mean, isn't every quarterback in the NFL need a stronger running game? I mean, you know, yeah. it's like it, it's it's it takes so much weight off your shoulders and things. And and there's I don't want to get into it, but there's so many things that have gone into Jameis's turnovers. Uh, and I think the biggest reason that not a lot of people talk about is that when he hits the field from we'll say week eight all the way back to his rookie year if he doesn't score a touchdown he has learned that when he comes back on the field he's going to be down another touchdown or another field goal yeah or like he had to take a lot of chances pushing the ball down the field because he had to score that drive because the other team was going to Mm -hmm. you know you know and there was one there's one play that i remember and even in this last game that kind of is an example of that um the Bucks. I think they were third and three, maybe third and four, something like that. They were on the, I don't know, the ten yard line. Um, so they were in the red zone, you know, pretty close to the end zone. And rather than going for the first down, they went for the score, and they missed it, and it killed the drive. You know, um, and I just, it, it was one of those. I, I feel like we see that so often, and have seen that so often, like. I mean, try to go for the score always. I'm I'm 100% with you on that, and I'm always for scoring points. But you know, at the co- at the potential cost of the drive, like, uh, it, and I think I rewatched that play a few times, and there wasn't necessarily a good first down play to go to as well. That's um, yeah. I I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, it's I might not have been a like Godwin you're... target. No, maybe not. I uh, no, I think it was the one where he overthrew Humphreys. Yeah, maybe, but, I, yeah. but, I, but I think that ended up being a a, a a a a penalty, and that's where they did get their touchdown. Anyway, yeah. I, yeah. I think I know what you're talking about, and what you would like to see as a fan is where was the guy that wasn't in the end zone but had enough yardage for the first down? Yeah, and, it, and there was nobody there. Like they were all in the end zone. It was either we're going to score or we're not. Like, that was it. There was no we're going to score or we can check it down and get the first down. Right. Yeah, and and I'm not exactly sure when or where or what happened. And, you know, um, I think you might – and like I said, I don't know. But I think you might getting – I think the play that you're talking about didn't kill the drive mm-hmm. but because they got a penalty, but it would have, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, but yeah, I, I remember. Yeah, but I, I, I get it. Um, I don't know. It's I'm not going to harp on something that minute. You know what I mean? I understand mm-hmm. what you're saying, but I'm just saying, like, okay. Yeah, I wish I had. A, I wish I had a pony. There you go. I um, get it. He says, uh, looking at another player uh, and another player for comparison, Melvin Gordon's first season. Some analysts spoke of oh, him God. like he was a bust. But he, he was, was able to turn that year around. Or he was able to turn that around by year two. I hope yeah. we can get a coach in Tampa that can do the same for Rojo. Yeah. Okay. I'm with you. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, Justin and our talk with him uh, back in the first half of this episode completely called Rojo a bust. Um, I I have always said, and I will maintain it even about Rojo. I, I think don't think he. I don't think he did. I, I think he just kind of got off track. It's possible, but a lot of people have called Rojo a bust. This is uh, true, and I'm I'm going to reiterate this. I think it it is wrong to label any player a success or a bust until we get to the end of their rookie contract, and that I'm going to throw that out with Donovan Smith, Jameis Winston, Vernon Hargraves, Noah Spence. I mean, God, look at Noah Spence. We thought he was going to be the the next golden boy on our defensive line, and now what is he? I just went through the whole defensive line talking about the defense that I didn't even mention his name. Yeah, like, exactly. That, that's how much he's not on the okay. team. Will Golston. <laughs> yeah. He's got a big contract, right? He's gone. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, you look at those guys, but then you look at, uh, uh, you know, Rojo, what's he going to do? Vita Vea. He's had a great first couple of, uh, or last couple of games, had a rough first part of the season. People were calling him a bust. I think it's safe to say Vita Vea is a bust. Well, no, he's yeah, not. That is a dead, that's a dead on impression. Exactly. Of, of everybody. On. It's it's how they <laughs> verbalize it even on Facebook. 
And I, I still stick to the, like, we don't know with Rojo. Like if you have made yeah. your mind up of Rojo, if he's good or bad, a bust or like, even if you're the most adamant Rojo fan, you're like, he's going to be a hall of Famer. You're just like, give him the chances. Both of you are wrong. Like we, we have no idea there. Yeah. It's the sample size is so small. Yeah. We have zero, zero idea of what Rojo can be as a pro. Now, does it look promising? No, (laughs) (laughs) but, but it's, it's way, 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 way too early to call him a bus. Like he, he hasn't had a chance, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it'd be the same thing as Alex Kappa, Justin Watson. Um, I think that's it as far as the draft picks from this year goes. But I mean, you know, those are all guys who really haven't – their sample size is just way too small right now uh, to call them anything. So, all right. Uh, that is going to do it for Alex's email. We have one final email to get to tonight, Ren. This comes from possibly a new emailer. This mm-hmm. is Chris from Inland Empire in California. We have a lot of Chris's. I don't we do. remember one from Inland Empire, California. I don't think I've ever heard of a place called Inland Empire, California ever before in my life. So Should we Google it? Is it like next to? Not right now. I'm, we shouldn't. But I'm going to read I'm his gonna. email. Here's what he says. He says, here's my rant for all of you Bucks fans calling for Dirk Cutter to be fired. I spell Inland. I-N-L-A-N-D. <laughs> Empire. E-M-P-I-R-E. California, C A L I F. Okay, I'm going to go back to reading this. Here's my rant for all of you Bucks fans calling for Dirk Cutter to be fired. We've had three coaches since 2012, and that's the length of Gruden's tenure as coach. Despite the record, the team is on track to finish in the top 10, maybe even for the, the top five offense, and that has never happened in my 21 years as a fan. Is that Apparently true? It, it's been a movie. What? I wasn't listening. Is that true? Sorry. What's true? That I, the, I was not he, listening. <laughs> no, not at all. He says, he says, despite the record, the team is on track to finish in the top 10, maybe even the top five in offense, and that has never happened in my 21 years as a fan. I feel like just a couple of years ago, this team finished in the top five in offense. Yeah, wasn't it Cutter's first year as I a think it was OC? Cutter's first year, first year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I, I don't know uh, behind that. Um, I will say, historically, the Buccaneers have never been a good offensive team. Uh, and this is the first time we've had a fairly decent offense. Um, maybe you mean maybe you mean scoring offense. Maybe, yeah. Maybe it, that's the question. What do you mean by a good offense? Um, but I do think that the Buccaneers did finish as a top five offense, maybe at least top ten in Cutter's first year. Inland Empire uh-huh. is in California. Shocking. Uh-huh. Uh huh. It is due. It's pretty big. I, it's like a. I don't know if it's a county or what. Maybe it's a county. It's got the Joshua Tree National Park in it. Okay. It is directly east of Los Angeles and Long Beach okay. and Irvine. So uh, a little south, southish in the in the state. I don't know. It, it's a very it's a very small little key. I don't I don't know L A at all. I care less about L A. No offense, anybody lives. No, I guess anybody <laughs> lives. Does it? We know anybody lives in L A. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Like I just don't. I, I'm sure it's a great place. Actually, no. I I think. People are crazy for living out there. Your whole water supply goes off a river that's drying up. Move. Um, yeah. It's a, okay. That's it. That's about all I got for it. I-40, right. I-15, run through it. So it's 215. <laughs> Funny story. My wife once drove three hours the wrong direction because the coast is on the other side over there. What? She's an East Coast oh, girl. Oh, oh, over there, she drove three hours the wrong direction because she was navigating by the coastline, and mm. it's on the wrong side. She forgot. No, yeah. apparently it was a movie too. Huh? Chris she goes does, on. He does. says, "My point is, it was a blowing- David Lynch movie. Ooh, I gotta watch that. Okay, you do that. Let's let's move back to this. My point is, blowing everything up every two years hasn't worked." Cutter is already four more wins away from having as many wins as Shiano and Lovey combined. In fact, he would also do that in one less season than the previous two coaches combined, assuming the Glazers do the right thing and, in all caps, retain Cutter. A new coach means a new staff, possibly a new offense for Jameis. And Jameis hasn't even mastered the offense the Bucks are currently running. I cringe every time he throws the ball to Mike Evans. His ball placement when throwing to him is going to get Evans killed. 
retain the coaching staff and have somebody like Quarles or Buckner or hell, even Duffner bring in some talent on defense and don't let Cutter or anyone who doesn't know shit about defense touch the defense and make the Bucks an NFL defense again. The Baltimore game clearly showed our defense is still Bush League and that all we need, and that's all we need, 11 and 5 would be easy with a competitive defense and a kicker who can consistently make kicks. Maybe I might sound a little silly, but with all the talent we have, keeping the staff and core of the offense, maybe except for the O line, is important. The numbers don't lie. A caller mentioned our records in Scruton. Four coaches, 10 years, no playoffs. You guys really want to make it five coaches in 11 years. One more than Cutter will have to walk the plank if he need be. Tampa Bay Buccaneers for life. Huh. Well, I think I would agree with just about everything you said two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I mean, what what Chris puts here is basically has been our argument for a couple of years, Ren. Yeah, I mean, it was our argument all last year. It was our argument most of this year. Um, like, I I get it. The thing is, and this is what we talked about with Justin. You and I have had this conversation a few times. I don't know that that bringing in a new head coach is a complete do-over. Now, we saw it with Chiano. We saw it with Lovey. Mm-hmm. I don't think we really saw it with Cutter because there was a lot of... Con- there was a lot of... Um, no, not at all. I mean, maybe we saw it moving from Lovey into Mike Smith, but not overall as a team. It's It doesn't... Getting a new coach, and this is what I've come to see, getting a new coach does not necessarily mean a complete... And total start over, a, a blow up and a rebuild. Uh, let's tear it all down and and build it back up into my new image. Like, in fact, I would say that if a coach wants to do that, then the Glazers need to not hire that guy. I don't know. I mean, are you talking about just the coaching staff? Or are you talking about the players? As no, well? I'm, I'm talking about everything. Like players, co- like they want to fight. They want to bring in all their own coaching staff. That's fine. I don't care. I'm talking about the players and and everything that we have here. You don't blow up the entire team and just start over. Like now with the we've I mean, got that, a that, good team. Yeah, that's what they're doing in Oakland right now. Like he's just Gruden's just tearing that down to the studs. Yeah, like he, he's just like he's like no, what, he's not good? even tearing it down to the studs. He's getting the studs out of there, like Khalil Mack. <laughs> and that's, that's so bad. Why? Why do you do that to yourself with these jokes, Brent? No comment. <laughs> no comment. No comment. So yeah, but that's you. You know, of course, that's what I mean. But yeah, so no. If if a head coach wants to come in and, and hire all his own coaches, that's pretty you know standard operation. Mm-hmm. So I can see that. Um, if a coach wants to come in and and, and get rid of all the good players because he wants to start over and, like you said, make it in his own image and get all these draft picks, and then, no, I don't want to do that either, right. obviously. Like, you know, uh, so, I, just, I mean, I understand what Chris is saying. Like you said, like, we get it. Uh, I think our defense is more talented than he gives it credit for. Mm-hmm. Um, I Like I said, uh, I thought our defense played pretty well. Um it was almost like a per- like Baltimore almost had to play a perfect game on offense, mm-hmm. and then you keep saying that, but then Lamar Jackson won like four or five, and it's you know and put right. and took the Chiefs to overtime. You're like, well, okay, um, but the Bucks had their chances with turnovers and drops, and you know it, it should have been a much closer game. Like the Bucks should have been leading in the fourth quarter and said coming back. But anyway, the point is that I'm. And I think Brent, you're with me on this. I understand what you're saying. Most of it, I agree with, but I think it's just too it's just too late now. It's just mm-hmm. too late. And I'm going to go back to why I was clinging on to Cutter, and now that I I don't, just because I understand the offensive numbers are intoxicating, and it's something we have not seen in Tampa Bay ever, ever in 40 plus years. But that doesn't mean the next guy can't do it too. Like what he said with the talent that we have on the team. And that was my final straw was like, what am I scared about? Like, it doesn't, I know it's happened. You see it happen, but it also goes, it also goes the other way. It also flips the other way. So 
or stay status quo, you know, like it did with when Gruden came in. The yeah. defense stayed status quo. You know, it was the offense that got improved. So, yeah, I, I hear you. I don't think amount of time or you got the wrong coach, you got the wrong coach. And and unless you want to email back and make an argument that we should have kept Shiano, we could should have kept Lovey, should have kept Raheem, uh, then I'll listen to that argument. But if you're happy with those, then it doesn't matter how many years it took to get rid of them. If you think it was the right move, it was the right move. Yeah. I don't want to go back and make those arguments. <laughs> <laughs> Though at the time I might have, but I'm not going to make those arguments now. Yeah, look, I'm going to reiterate what I said on the instant cast. I am not campaigning one way or the other. I think Cutter will be fired. I don't think that there's I don't think there's a snowball's chance in hell that he's going to be here next year. But uh if the glut, if the Glazers do retain him, I understand why. I get that. I mean, the arguments that Chris makes here, I understand why they would make that that call. If the Glazers get rid of him and bring in somebody else, I really understand why they would do that. So, um, but it, you know, there's a difference between what I think is going to happen and what I think should happen. And I, I'm just I'm not campaigning for it one way or the other, to be honest with you. So, um, you know, I I think the writing is plain plain as anything out here in the next. 12 days, 12, 13 days, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers will have a new coach. And, um, well, the, they won't have a coach. Well, yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool, though. Yeah. Uh, you're fired. What if, what if they already Dirk had Cutter, the next guy? <laughs> Dirk Cutter, you're fired. Uh, there's a presser in two hours in the podium room for to introduce a <laughs> new head coach. What? Huh? Not even Rappaport knows. Um, so, I, I mean, yeah, it, it it'll certainly be interesting um, to see what happens. It, it's uh, it, it's never boring, you know, it, with everything that happens here in Tampa Bay. So we'll see. <laughs> That's something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll 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 see where they go. But um, I, Chris, I get your point, man. I really do. Uh, I don't agree, and and I don't think that the Glazers will agree with you. But I do. I do understand your logic. So, and I don't agree, and I don't think the Glazers will agree with you either. So, yeah. So, all right, Randall. Well, that is going to do it for us. That is all of our emails. So, I want to say thank you to everybody who sent in emails. Um, if you didn't get to send in one this week, hey, listen. The email address is thepewtercast at gmail.com. Send those in by Tuesday. That's the night we record. Uh, this coming week, though, Tuesday is Christmas Day. So, Rent, I'm not quite sure how this is going to work for this next week uh, or what we'll do, um, but we'll figure that out, and we'll be sure to let everybody out there know. But in the meantime, why don't you tell the folks out there where they can find you on the Internet? Best place to find me is on Twitter at Rendax, R E N underscore D A X T. I'm always down to talk Buccaneers football. And if you don't want to put your question or your comment out there on Twitter, my DMs are always open and I'll talk football there as well, too. And if you guys want to get in touch with me, my uh, profiles across all the social medias is at Brent Allen Live. And the show, you can reach the show at the Pewtercast on Twitter. You can find us at facebook.com forward slash the pewtercast, or like I said, you can shoot us an email to the pewtercast at gmail.com. Well, guys, coming up next, you guys are going to get our buck in the news show. That'll be coming out here very, very shortly on the back end of this episode. This is where we will have turned the corner. We're going to talk about all the news that have come out of One Buck Place over the course of this week. We'll take a look at some of the roster transactions, and there have been a few already that have happened and uh, we'll turn towards this Cowboys game as we really turn towards the end of the season. Uh, So with that, Ren, we'll get out of here for now, but until then we'll end the show as always go bucks.